So what do you believe happens after you die? What's, what's going to take place? You know, there, people have a variety of different beliefs when you think about that. Many people um, just plain don't want to think about what happens after you die. Have you noticed that? The no. <laughs> funny thing is somebody said that the, most, the, the big taboo that we have now in our culture, the thing we don't talk about, sex we can talk about, that's no big deal. Death we don't talk about. They fell asleep, right? We, we use different kinds of words to try to describe it. But the fact is, is that we really don't want it. You, you talk to people that should be preparing wills. Uh, I won't ask you to show your hands, but I wonder how many people in this room have a will, a trust, or something like that set up. Uh, I, I said, you don't have to show hands. Uh, but good, Bill. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good idea. It, but see, now, why, a lot of people, why don't they? Well, I don't have anything. Well, yeah, you all have something. Bills or something like that, okay? You, you all have something to pass on to the, the, the next people, uh, belongings and things like that. But, but why don't we do it? Well, because we don't want to look at death. You know, some of you are saying, great, Bill. This is one of the things I don't want to look at, and you're going to talk about it this morning. Well, in fact, that's kind of what we're talking about every week, isn't it? As we're talking about the witnesses of the resurrection. The witnesses of the resurrections, uh, and we're doing this before Easter because we want to look at the different people that give us evidence and proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The fact is, is that the, 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 the witnesses, there is more evidence, frankly, right now, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than what you ate for breakfast this morning. Okay, you can think about that one. <clears throat> Some of you who didn't eat breakfast said, aha, no. Uh, people have all different kinds of thoughts about life after death. And where do they get that belief? Well, for some people, they're going to come back again and again and again until they get it right, reincarnation, right? Um, for some people, they believe it's just done, right? When you de when you dead, you can't get it out. When you're dead, you're dead, right? When you die, you die, and you're just gone. It's over, finished, complete, nothing more, to, and so you're done. But for the Christian, we believe that there is life after death, reality after death, a new body and a, and a new place and an incredible place where, where we get to live forever. <clears throat> I was um, thinking about some of the movies that, that have been affecting people and their thoughts about life after death. Uh, here's one, The Shack. The Shack, which a little girl has um, died. Now, this one's not a true story, um, but, but, it, but it actually shows images of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how it does that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somewhat controversial, too, for some people, but just enough said on that. Um, this one, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. Any of you see that one? None of you saw that? Okay, some of you are going to admit it. Yeah. Did you know that that was a false story? That mom and, uh, and um, Kevin Malarkey, the son, um, Kevin is a quadriplegic and that um, at, was injured and actually uh, was in a coma, had some, a number of different people. In fact, the, the mom said she had 40 pastors ministering to her and Kevin while she, and, and her husband while um, he was in his um, coma. Uh, eventually comes out of that, still still um, injured, still quadriplegic, but but is alive today. But th the book went out. Uh, Dad wrote the book. I'm sorry, um, I can't help but the play on words. Malarkey is their last name. <laughs> that was an odd one. Um, his mom has been actually doing a lot of things, trying to tell people. She, she tried to talk to a Tyndale house and say, this is not true. Please don't publish this. Anyways, um, sad thing is, is that it was a great story, but, but it wasn't true. Um, how, how about the one, um, the movie about the little boy who went to heaven, Heaven is for Real? Um, that, in fact, is interesting because um, the, um, that little boy uh, who's now in his uh, late teens uh, actually has been on some talk shows and, and after hearing about the other books said, no, look, I know what happened. I know what I saw. It, it really happened to me. Um, in fact, um, then there's the book, the, the, the movie and the book uh, Miracles from Heaven. 
Remember miracle, Miracles from Heaven? It was about a little girl that um, had uh, an incurable disease. It would cause all kinds of pain. And um, she actually was up in a tree, fell out of that tree. Uh, the rescue people came. She actually <laughs> fell inside the trunk of the tree and was trapped there for like five or six hours until the rescue people could get her out. During that time, she says that she saw Jesus, talked to Jesus, and came back and, and shared some of that story. And she said, and Jesus healed me. And the amazing thing is uh, when they're meeting with the doctor, the doctor is talking to the mom, and the mom says, you mean to say that a little girl had an incurable disease that was killing her, that was making her terribly sick, caused her all kinds of pain, that she climbs up into a tree, falls 30 feet out of it, into a tree trunk, sits there for five hours, and now she's cured? And the doctor said, yes. <laughs> the doctor said it. Um, why did it happen? How did it happen? I don't know. Here's an interesting one is uh, some of the comments about that movie. If you go on and uh, look at the YouTube uh, for, the, for the, pre the preview of the film, it says, here's one, reasons I won't be seeing this film. Awful dialogue, Christian propaganda, already seen the entire film in the trailer. A lot of people criticize the trailer because, well, everything's there. She falls out of a tree. She comes, she's healed. She's uh, um, no longer got the disease. That's the story. Well, the, I got to tell you, there's a lot more to the story than that. But that's what they saw. Uh, can we stop with this whole God, miracles, heaven, Jesus, blank, expletive deleted in case you need to know, and actually focus on making good movies? Here's one. Everything has a scientific explanation. Every single illness, every single organ failure, every single virus, and every single cancer has a scientific explanation. It is traceable in our DNA to our parents, to the way we eat, to our brains, and to evolution. Miracles are just another way of saying the God of the gaps. Grow up and start contributing to scientific cancer research, which will bring the end to tragedies such as the one in this movie. And then I found this note, and it's from Texas Lil. By the way, the little girl was from Texas. Give it a break. I've known this family for years. They have already heard all the nasty comments people can make, so what some are posting is nothing new. Annabelle was ill, very ill. I know that for a fact. I know of the frustration they experienced with the local doctors and hospitals unable to diagnose her illness and saying it was nothing. It was in her head. Well, it was in her head. It was a neuromuscular disorder, but it took Boston Children's to diagnose it. I know for a fact Annabelle fell into the tree, just like the trailer shows. I remember the day it happened. I was almost like, it was almost like baby Jessica that fell into the well back in the 1980s only it didn't take as long to get her out. I know for a fact, Annabelle has recovered from an illness from which there has been no cure. That all is very true. I'm not one that falls for hyped up miracle stories and religious propaganda. I'm more of a believer in the conspiracy of chaos. Sometimes things happen that just don't make sense. She hit her head. I've been knocked out and have also had very lucid dreams that seem real. Our minds are very powerful. Dreams and reality are not any different to the mind. Something happened, and Annabelle believes it, so guess what? That makes it true to her whether it does to me or anyone else. The truth of the matter is Annabelle is well, and the results are real. It may not make sense, but it might, some, might someday in the medical world. Her doctor in Boston said it was because she hit her head that she was healed, and they're not hiding that. Annabelle's dad tells me that Christy wrote the book to write down her experience and put closure to what they had all been through. The trailer is not the movie's whole story. I share this one, and this is note especially, because there's all different kinds of opinions. As I said, they, they go on, and there's a list of thousands or hundreds, I should say, of comments about this. I, I need to note that I appreciate what John MacArthur said. That he said. We don't build our faith on these kinds of stories. 
A relationship with Jesus does not depend upon these kinds of stories, whether they're fact or not. But the thing is, I, I, I got thinking, to, this, this morning we're going to look at John, the Apostle John, the beloved disciple as he's oftentimes referred to. He's the disciple that you might remember Peter leans into the chest of the beloved disciple and asks him, who asks Jesus who's going to... Um, to be his traitor who is it that's going to turn on him who is it that's going to reject him and, and Jesus is right here and John is right here by him Judas is behind him that's sort of laying on their side and John says who, who's going to betray you and Jesus tells John the one with whom I dip my bread and he takes a piece of bread and he dips it over here and he gives it to Judas this is John the beloved. John's the one who's walking on the beach after Peter has um, come back and they've had this fishing experience and then Jesus has been talking with Peter and do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter keeps saying, I like you, I like you, I like you. Fine. Jesus says, okay, do you really like me? And, and they have that conversation and then, <laughs> because Peter's been on the hot seat for too long, he turns and says, well, what about him? And, you know, and, and Jesus responds, you know, if he's going to live forever, that's fine. It's of no matter to you. Now, because of that, everyone said, oh, John's going to live forever. No, that wasn't Jesus' point. He says, you know, Peter, think about yourself. Don't be worrying about John. This is John. John's the one disciple who does not die at the hands of others. The only one. However, John gets the res the. the the responsibility of being sent to the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos, we'll talk about in a few moments. And he's, there he's exiled. And possibly when Nero dies and another Nero comes in, another Caesar comes in, then John goes back and dies on the mainland, a very, very old man. And I wonder how they received John's message because that's what we read from already in Revelation chapter 4. In fact, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 1, verses um, I believe it was 9 through 18. And, and I want you to think about it. This is John who has this experience. He says, I'm, I'm in on the Sabbath. I'm, I'm on the Lord's day. And it's probably a Sunday. And he says, I'm, I'm in the Spirit. And, and suddenly I see all this. Now, is that any weirder than what this little girl had happened to her? Where she saw Jesus and Jesus said, you're healed. And you can't stay here. You need to go back and be with your family. Is that any weirder? I'm afraid that this may actually be weirder than what she experienced because of what John describes as you go through the book of Revelation. It's just, uh, I would like to have a show of hands. How many have actually read the book of Revelation? Interesting. And incidentally, it is, um, notice, we oftentimes call it revelations, but it is actually revelation. It is one revelation that God reveals to John, the beloved disciple, as he is out on the island of Patmos, preparing for his own life's end. So let's pick up the story in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. And may I also ask you this? Why haven't you read Revelation? Some of us haven't read it because, you know, well, we just, you know, I just don't want to deal with that, right? <laughs> it's that death stuff again. Um, or it's too weird to understand. It's too complicated. There's too much stuff going on there. Some of you just are too busy to read the Bible. Now, now that, that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> whole other issue. But why is it that we haven't read the Revelation of Jesus Christ? Now, here's another interesting thing about it. Um, if you look closely at the first few verses of Revelation, it says, blessed are you who read this word. Did you hear that? Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Revelation is a great book just to read through. I would caution you if you're going to read Revelation, leave all of the charts and maps alone, okay? There's all kinds of numerous charts, and they're just going to really confuse you as you try to understand it. Just read it. In fact, try this. Read it out loud. And, and 
the you version on the Bible is a great tool for that. Just listen. This, notice what it says. If you hear revelation, you're going to be blessed. Just by reading, somebody reading it, and somebody else hearing it, you will be blessed. Well, with that in mind, verse 9. <clears throat> I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What's John saying? I was out on an island. And I'm out on that island, why? Because of the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. Wow, that sounds like he's out there for something fun, doesn't it? Now, it's interesting. It is a prison island. Some people say that the reason why he's actually out there on that island is that he went as a missionary to the prisoners on Patmos. I'm confident he was a missionary to the prisoners on Patmos. I'm not confident. In fact, according to Tertullian and Vesuvius, a couple other historians, he wasn't out there sent as a missionary. Well, on, on one hand, yes, he was. But, but in reality, he was sent there as a prisoner. So when it says that um, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, he's saying the privilege that I've had of serving Jesus has got me on this island. I am here because I've been telling people about Jesus Christ. I am here, yes, because I get the privilege to suffer. I am here because I have given testimony to Jesus Christ. It's, he's not out on a Hawaiian island, okay, with this special cruise experience. It's a, well, well, let me read on, I'll come back. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his sight, right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. I wonder what they thought when those seven churches got the letter because it gets a lot stranger than that. Beasts traveling around, pregnant woman, all kinds of things like this, just amazing, fire and judgment, flying monsters like helicopters. I'm sorry, not supposed to make those kind of editorial comments. All kinds of strange images that, that John sees and he writes this and he sends it out to the seven churches. And what does Jesus say to him? Write what you see and send it to the churches. Whatever you see, write it down. He will be told that, I believe it's seven different times in the book of Revelation. Write it down, write it down, Write it down, John. Write it down and tell the churches. Write it down and tell them. Now, there is one instance at least, maybe more, where you might remember as he's talking to Jesus and as he's seeing things, he starts to write and the angel says, no, don't write that one down. This one's to be kept private until the end of time. John the Beloved, 
He's nearing the end of his life, exiled on the island of Patmos. The rulers hope that by sending him there, this last disciple, they'll stop his influence on the, on the rest of the world. An old man, he sees a vision of the one that he loved so much so many years before. Remember, this is John, who also stood with Mary and Mary and in front of the cross of Christ. This is, this is John. Jesus looks down at him, hanging there from the cross, and says, John, my brother, next to you is my mom. John, you're now her son. Take care of my mom, please. And he gives his responsibility as the oldest child, the oldest son. He gives it to his beloved friend, John. John stands there and watches him as he cries out, it is finished. And then as he looks to heaven, and, and John's still watching, and he sees him, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he sees him drop his head as he says, it is finished. But this isn't the first time John's seen him, is it? John's been with him for th over three years. John was on that fishing boat next to Simon Peter's that, that when, when Jesus says, Simon, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. John was on the other boat with his brother and they had gone out into the deep and they had to help when the two boats were almost sunk by all the fish that they caught that night. John was there through so many of these different experiences. Every of the in, one of the intimate experiences, John was present. Mount of Transfiguration, they go up onto the mountain. And who does Jesus take with him? Peter, James, and John. And up on that mountain, John's actually seen him transfigured, seen the glory of the Lord shining on his face and on Moses and Elijah. He's experienced that amazing moment. He's heard God speak from heaven. John was there. John was there when, when Jesus um, rose from the dead. In fact, remember, who is it that runs to the tomb when Mary comes back and says, we look, the tomb's open, the rock's there, his body's gone. What do we do? Somebody stole his body. Mary, who we looked at last week. Who runs to the tomb? John runs to the tomb. Actually, he must be a little bit younger than Peter. Or at least he's faster. We know that. Because John gets there first, stops on the outside. Peter rushes on in. Kind of a little bit like their personalities as well, by the way. And so, so but John's there. John's there with the rest of the disciples when Jesus appears in the room more than once. Remember, he just suddenly appears. John's there. And as I mentioned earlier, John's on the beach when, when Jesus is talking to Peter and trying to restore Peter after he's denied him three times. And now Jesus is trying to help him to be forgiven and feel that forgiveness. And John's right there. That's John. Exile on the of Patmos, suffering for Christ. Barnes says Patmos was a lonely, desolate, barren, uninhabited, seldom visited. It had all the requisites which could be desired for a place of punishment and banishment. To that place would accomplish all that a persecutor could wish in silencing the apostle without putting him to death. But the cool thing about God is it didn't silence him even though he was exiled, did it? Someone who has recently um, traveled in that area said that he actually saw Patmos. It's, it is a mere mass of barren rocks, dark in color and cheerless in form. It lies out in the open sea near the coast of Western Asia Minor. It has neither trees nor rivers nor any land for cultivation except some little nooks between the ledges of rocks. There is still a dingy grotto remaining in which the aged apostle is said to have lived and in which he is said to have had this vision. A chapel covers it, hung with lamps kept burning by the monks. Patmos <laughs> is not your beautiful island. It was a terrible place to go. 
Eusebius said John was imprisoned at Patmos under the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian. According to Victorinus, John, though aged, was forced to labor in the mines located at Patmos. Early sources also indicated that about A.D. 96, at Domitian's death, excuse me, John was allowed to return to Ephesus when the emperor Nerva was in power. Out on an island, and he has a vision. And uh, if you get that letter to your church or to you, what are you thinking when it arrives? Oh, great, this is crazy John out there on Patmos. <laughs> This is, this is insane, right? I mean, there had to be some of that thought. There had to be that sense of no way, much like some of these movies that I was mentioning earlier. What does John say? He says, I'm, I'm alone there. I, turn, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. He says, I'm out here. I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm going through these experiences. On the Lord's day, I'm in the Spirit. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit had given him a closeness and an intimacy, and he's just, he's just connecting with God. Hopefully, like we try to do in worship, that we try to connect with God. That's what our desire is. Isn't that why you're here today, I hope? I, I don't think you're here just to see me perform, because that's not going to do very much for you. But I hope that we're here because we want to get into the presence of God. And that's where John's at. He's in the presence of God. He's feeling the presence of God. The Spirit is there touching him, and he sees this vision. And then he goes on. He says, I turn, and I saw to see the voice. Now, just in case you're wondering, you can't see a voice, can you? I want to see where the voice is coming from. I want to see whose voice that is. That's what he turns to see. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I, I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And, and among the lampstands was someone like, like the what? The Son of Man. I turned to see the voice. Can you imagine what went through his mind as he turned? He turns and he sees these, these seven golden lampstands, which, by the way, represent the seven churches that the letters are all going to. And he, and he sees these lampstands there and there are the angels there. And, and, and it's like, it's, it's an amazing kind of thing. And in the middle of it was someone like that looks like the Son of Man. In fact, back up in Revelation 1, it says, the revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He turns and who does he see? He looks very different. He'll describe him with white hair. He'll describe him with gold blazed across him. He'll describe him with feet like bronze. He'll describe his eyes like fire and even a sword of the Spirit coming out of his mouth. And incredible the way he's describing him. And yet, this is the Son of Man. That's the phrase that Jesus used. Study the book of Mark. It's a phrase that has referred to Jesus, the Messiah. To really understand this, maybe you need to look at a passage like Daniel 7, verse 13. It says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like what? a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed, the son of man, Jesus Christ. Someone like a son of man. Spurgeon said, How sweet it is when the Lord himself is so present in a congregation that the preacher, whoever he may be, is altogether forgotten. I pray you, dear friends, when you go to a place of worship, always try to see the Lord's face rather than the stars in his hand. Look at the sun and you will forget the stars. John says, I looked, and there's the, 
some of the son of man. And there's these candelabras all around and, and he's holding these stars, which are, that's gotta be incredible too. How do you hold stars? Okay, so he's, he's holding these seven stars in his hand. But what does John focus on? The son of man. He focuses on Jesus Christ and he sees Jesus. <coughs> And then look at how he describes him. He says, he's, his eyes are like a flame of fire. In, in the scripture, let's face it, fire is often associated with judgment. And Jesus' eyes are the eyes of the one who is coming back to judge. And he says that, that they're eyes of, of fire and they displayed this searching, penetrating judgment that he's about to do on earth or someday. Romans 8 says, verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who is it that judges? Christ Jesus. But take note, Jesus already faced the fire for us so that we don't have to face that judgment. And look at the next description. His feet were like fine brass. Okay, fire is associated with judgment, but feet like brass refined in a furnace speak of somebody who's already been through the fire already been tested already been judged and has now survived and who went through the refiner's fire but Jesus Christ the fire of death second corinthians says it this way for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live again should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now, I do have a question as I was looking at this. I don't know about you, but so I can understand the, the, the blazing feet there that, that represent he's already been, been judged. He was judged on that cross and was perfect and therefore able to pay our price. Now, I, and I can even see the blazing eyes, okay, the, the fire as he's coming to judge because he's going to do that. Even though he's full of love, he still has to judge and clean up this place. But, but the sword of the spirit, that kind of looks weird, doesn't it? Okay, you're walking around with a sword. This is not a dagger, by the way. This is a big sword. It's a double-edged sword. You can't touch it without, it's razor sharp. I mean, it's going to really wound you if you grab a hold of that. Sword of the Spirit. Oh, I'm sorry, I just gave you a hint, didn't I? What's the sword that's coming out of his mouth? Well, think about Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. What is it that's coming out of his mouth? The very word of God. That word that is a sword, that is a weapon against all the powers of darkness. It's the living word that he's been speaking and living himself. Matthew 4 says it this way. Verse 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's the word of God that's coming out of Jesus. John 6, 63 and 68, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John 12, 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. That's the sword that's coming out of Jesus' mouth. And his face, his face was shining like the sun in all of its brilliance. John 8, 12 said, when jo Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, what? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, I'm the light. How about Isaiah 60, verse 19? No longer will you have the sun light for day, by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord as an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Or Revelation 22, 5, there will be no more night. This is the same passage. There's going to be no more mourning. There's going to be no more crying. There's going to be no more pain. 
They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. One of the translations says, for the Lord God is the light. And they will reign forever and ever. Now, with him looking so different, white hair, dressed in this full robe, which speaks to his authority, dressed with the gold, which looks like the high priest, the high, way the high priest was covered. How does John know this is Jesus? He turns, he looks. The voice is totally different. It like, sounds like rushing wind. I mean, th this is incredible, the, the, the voice. Even the voice doesn't sound familiar anymore, does it? Totally different, totally changed. He didn't sound like Jesus. He didn't look like Jesus. He didn't know it was Jesus until something happened. Did you see it? Until Jesus touched him. See, again, he'd seen Jesus glorified already. He'd seen this bright light when he was up there on the mountain of transfiguration. He's already witnessed Jesus in an incredible kind of way. I mean, he got to do what the rest of us would have loved to have done, been there for those three years in his ministry. He saw him walk on the water. He saw him feed the thousands from just a little bit of bread. He saw him heal the sick, make the lame walk, the blind see. He witnessed stuff that oh, we're all kind of saying, I wish I could have seen one of those things. John saw all that, but now, Jesus touches him. Revelation 1.4 To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him. By the way, watch this order. I'm not doing this incorrectly. I'm reading this straight out of the way the word says it. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before this throne, the angels that represent the various churches. But did you hear the order? Now, if you notice in Revelation 4, did you hear the other way, the way we normally say it? Who was and is and is to come. But now, here at the beginning, John says, from him who is, the risen Christ is right there in front of him. He is. The I am is revealing himself one more time to one of his incredible servants. He is the one who is, the one who was. Yes, he did all that. He was there. He was there with you, John. He was there at the beginning of time. He was there at the start of creation, the one who was, and the one who is to come, and he's getting ready to come again. <clears throat> This week, I had the privilege of watching uh, the, um, the funeral of Billy Graham. One of the things that Billy Graham did was he preached Christ. He preached Christ. Uh, I, years ago, I used to read his articles in the newspaper, and every, every question he was asked... You know, how, do, how do I deal with my wife? How do I handle divorce? How do I deal with death? Every question he asked, it came back to, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He preached Christ. He says, the answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus was always at the heart of what he did and what he preached. And then the, uh, at his memorial service, they preached Christ. From every family member who got up there, um, especially his son Franklin at the end, who called this, this is a dad's last crusade. President Trump, Vice President Pence, other people that were there from around the world, and whoever was watching broadcast across the globe. The funeral. He was doing his last crusade. He had planned the message to himself. He had planned the speakers, the songs, and everything 10 years earlier when his wife, just after his wife had died. And he put together this plan that would one last time preach Christ. At the end of the funeral, what did Franklin do? By the way, one of the songs of with given a little bit of contemporary flavor to it, one of the main songs, I'm sure you can guess, just as I am without one plea, but as my God has died for me. And that, that, that old, old song that he ended every crusade night with, um, 
that touches hearts and souls again and again was played and sung there. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24 says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. And Christ crucified, Paul says, is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The Jews didn't like it and Gentiles didn't believe it. They thought it was crazy. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2 goes on. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Billy Graham preached Christ crucified. Incidentally, I've appreciated one of the other comments um, that, that I think it was um, um, Franklin said. It says, someday you will hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe one word of it. I'll be more alive now than I ever have been. I just changed addresses. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Graham preached Christ. I appreciate what his one daughter said and um, still, still touches my heart. As um, Three of Billy Graham's children had went through divorces. Um, all five of them went through times of major rebellion. Billy was gone much of their childhood. In fact, they all confessed the fact that mom raised us, dad wasn't there. Um, Franklin talks about the time he was a five-year-old and he you know, woke up in the morning and went to jump in bed with mom because he was afraid or something like that. And he got in bed and he says, who's that man next to you, mommy? <laughs> Daddy had come home late at night that night from a crusade months, had been away for months. But his, his daughter said, and she had already, she'd just been divorced she meets a man, a widower. She starts to connect with him. And he said, real fast, starts getting real quick, close to him. Um, mom calls up and says, please don't, um, don't, you know, slow down, slow down. Dad's at a crusade in Tokyo. And at the crusade, c calls her and says, please take a little more time. Slow, the, slow things down. And instead, she says, I'm going to do what I want to do. She gets married. Within a month, she knows he's so abusive, she has to leave. And as she heads back home to North Carolina, she knows her kids who are older are thinking, you know, great, Mom, you did it, you blew it. And she's thinking, Mom and Dad, who both tried to stop her just a month earlier, she's driving up the road, gets up to the house, and she's thinking, what, are they, what am I going to say, and what are they going to say? Everything about I should have listened and all that. She gets up to the top of the hill, standing out in the front of the house is Dad. She gets out of the car, and all Dad does... Billy Graham walks up to her, grabs her in his arms, and says, welcome home. She said, I learned that day about unconditional, the love, unconditional love of God. All Billy Graham tried to do throughout his life was preach Jesus Christ. Paul said, I preach Christ. What is John seeing? He says, look, I got I to gotta preach Christ. Franklin, um, one of the last comments he made that day was, what better time to accept Christ's salvation than at Billy Graham's funeral? Paul said in talking about communion, we proclaim the Lord's death. It's interesting. We're talking about witnesses of the resurrection. John has just seen the one that he loved so much, the one that he spent so much time by, but he's so different. But that touch has just blessed him in such an incredible way. John has just felt that touch again like he felt so many years before. And now he's going to tell the story of who Jesus is and what Jesus is going to be like when he comes back. But look at, look at what Paul said when speaking about communion, verse, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even though 
John seeing the risen Christ, even though everything is about his resurrection is what proves to us that he was, was able to pay the price. It was his death that paid the price. It was his death that took the judgment. It was his death that sets us free. It was his death that gives us life. And so we receive communion today. And what does it mean to proclaim? Well, it means to preach it. It means to make it known. It means to teach it. Yeah, every time we celebrate the Lord's table, we're saying that God is our Redeemer, that He has redeemed us, that the incarnate Christ the son of the living God who died on a cross, died there instead of me. Died there in our place. Died there to take our pain, our judgment, and purchase our forgiveness.